Key stretching is a process of adding salt or random data to a hash to make it difficult to guess the hash value. So salt is any variable information and salt can be added to uh, other algorithms as well in the forms of initialization vectors or nonces, numbers used only once. So adding salt makes it harder to guess the hash value of stored passwords. So even if attackers were to retrieve a list of password hashes, they're not going to know just by looking at those hashes what the password is. Even if they analyze those hashes, if you've added the appropriate amount of salt, it's going to make it very difficult for the attacker to conduct attacks where they can recover the password from the hash. Key strengthening or key stretching is also known as key strengthening. So it's the same thing. And we're going to talk about two key stretching algorithms here, bcrypt and password-based key derivation function 2 or pbkdf2. Bcrypt is based on Blowfish. Remember, Blowfish was that block cipher that was based on Two Fish. Uh, that was a Two Fish was that competitor to the Rindale uh, algorithm. Two Fish was later used to create Blowfish, which was uh, put as an open source algorithm by uh, Bruce Schneier. And Blowfish is available to the world as open source. It's often used with Unix and Linux distributions. Bcrypt is based on Blowfish, or you'll also find it in Unix and Linux distributions. It produces strings 60 bits in length, which is the, one of the bit sizes supported by Blowfish. And the resulting string will uh, be stored within the uh, shadow file. So basically what Bcrypt does is it takes uh, passwords and protects those passwords that are located in Linux in the shadow file, the shadow password file, slash shadow. Okay, so bcrypt will add salt in the form of random bits before encrypting those passwords with Blowfish. So it'll add salt and then it'll encrypt the password with Blowfish and then store that resulting uh, encrypted password. So the string it produces is 60 bits in length, uh, that hash that it produces, and then the string itself is stored. So even if an attacker were to recover that string, that string has added has added salt by bcrypt and it's been encrypted with blowfish so there's not much the attacker can do with that string it's very difficult to reverse engineer or determine what the password is from that string itself that's why bcrypt so helpful when a user authenticates this is how password hashes work when a user authenticates they type in their password and their username that password that they typed in goes through this same same process with bcrypt and then the result is compared to the hash on file. So instead of comparing the password itself, you compare the two hash values. If there's a match, you authenticate the user. The next uh, algorithm is password-based key derivation function 2, PBKDF2. This is a key stretching algorithm that adds salt with a minimum length of 64 bits. PBKDF2 uses HMAC hashes along with the salt to create a password. And then the resulting hash is either 128, 256, or 512 bits. PBKDF2 is widely used, uh, especially outside of Linux distributions. Most uh, Cisco devices use it. The Apple iOS operating system uses PBKDF2. And WPA2 Wi-Fi devices will also use PBKDF2 for, to store the, the password hashes when authenticating to a wireless network. So, PBKDF2 is very widely used, and those are the two that you're going to need to know for the exam. Another advantage with PBKDF2 is that it takes very little processing power, which is why a lot of Apple mobile operating systems use it. Because it takes a lot of less processing power and, and consequentially less power, it's good for mobile devices, so you will find it implemented in many different mobile devices. Now, PBKDF2, uh, because it takes little processing power, it's susceptible to brute force attacks because brute force attacks will just throw, they'll just continuously try and crack the password or the password hash by cycling the process over and over and over again. Okay, so because the process itself takes very little processing power, you can devote a lot of resources, a a lot of processing power will perform 
the functions very quickly. Okay, so the brute force attack can be very efficiently done. However, one of the main features with PBK DF2, just by its very nature, it makes it difficult for graphical processing units or GPUs to implement brute force attacks. A lot of attackers nowadays use GPUs instead of CPUs to perform brute force attacks. So the, what they'll do is they'll take, they'll have their computer set up with multiple graphics cards, and those GPUs have been found to perform calculations very rapidly, like with mining cryptocurrency or performing brute force attacks. So because PBKDF2 can't be calculated well with GPUs, it is also resistant to brute force attacks. So it's kind of a conundrum. Is it susceptible or is it resistant to brute force attacks? And there's kind of a debate within the cybersecurity sector about the implementations of it. So you don't really need to know that for the exam. You just need to know that PBKDF2 is good for mobile devices. It's widely used and it's another key stretching algorithm.